Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So To Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Welcome to the first ever episode of So To Speak, where we will take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I'm your host, Nico Perino, and I'm the Director of Communications for the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, most commonly referred to, of course, as FIRE. FIRE is an organization devoted to protecting civil liberties, such as the freedom of speech, in higher education. And while FIRE's focus is on higher education, for the most part, we also have a broader goal of educating the public about free speech principles. And that's what we're going to try to do here on this show. Our goal, I hope, is to publish a new episode every other week. I listen to a ton of podcasts, and I know that most podcasts like to stick to one kind of format, a news show, a commentary or interview show, or a scripted feature of sorts. But on So To Speak, we're going to try to mix it up a little bit. And from time to time, we'll feature episodes that have one or all of the above styles, depending, of course, on the story that we're trying to tell. I'm actually here right now in Philadelphia at FIRE's headquarters with FIRE President and CEO Greg Lukianoff, who was kind enough to indulge me in this podcast idea of mine, which I've been bugging him about for months now. (laughs) Greg, thanks for sitting down with me. Thanks for having me. So today on this first episode of ours, we have a heck of a heck of a show Uh, I was able to sit down for a super interesting interview in Washington with someone who I know is a personal hero of yours, and that's Jonathan Rausch. For those of our listeners who are unfamiliar with Jonathan Rausch's work, he is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He's a contributing editor of National Journal and The Atlantic. He's a prominent gay rights activist. And he's also, also the author of many books, including his free speech classic, Kindly Inquisitors, The New Attacks on Free Thought. But before we talk about Jonathan and his book, and we'll spend most of this show talking about Jonathan and his book, Greg, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself, because you're going to be a regular on this show (laughs) and will sometimes be a stand-in host for me, so it's important listeners get to know you. So, Greg, how did you get interested and involved in the fight for free speech, both on and off campus? Well, you know, I was the weird law student who went to law school specifically to do First Amendment law. Um, it's something I've been I've been interested in free speech since I was a little kid. I, a lot of times I attribute it to the fact that I have a Russian father and a British mother. And <laughs> my British mom really emphasized politeness. My father really emphasized, you know, brutal honesty if necessary. You know, talking about politeness as a form of deception. And you've, got, you've got, really got that Russian accent. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I, I, I can do my dad all day. Um, and uh, you know, and I grew up in a, in, a, in a neighborhood where there are a lot of other first uh, f- uh, first generation American kids. So interestingly, uh, multiculturalism is a lot of times used as a way of explaining why we need censorship. And I think it's the exact opposite. When you when you live in a genuinely multicultural uh, uh, environment, um, the first rule is hear people out and try to figure out what they're actually saying, not immediately jump on them with your norms about what you should say. I got a mo- I, and I even got more passionate about uh, freedom of speech as a student journalist at American University, working for the the, the Eagle newspaper. And you went to law school at Stanford. I went to law school at Stanford. Yeah, and uh, and uh, so and the amazing thing about um, uh, being a student journalist is you you get to see people come into your office and you see the wheels turning and then they're like, you shouldn't run that article, and I I don't know why yet, but I'll I'll figure it out. And I realized, you know, in seeing this in action so often, there's a deep um, censorship instinct. People people want to figure out an excuse to censor. And under those circumstances, that's why you have to have a really broad protection for freedom of speech with very few exceptions. So I went to Stanford. I took every class for law school. I, I, um, I took every class they offered on First Amendment. When I ran out of that, I did six credits on censorship during the Tudor dynasty. Um, you know, this is my lifelong dream. I did get laughed at a little bit for the idea of wanting to do something as impractical as uh, First Amendment law for my career, but you know, I've been doing it now since 2001. So, yeah, who who were some of your heroes, uh, for free speech heroes, while you were in law school? Oh, geez, yeah, so many. Um, Nadine Strawson, who I'm very happy to be able to say is you know a friend of mine. She was the president at ACLU. Yeah, the president of ACLU. Yeah. Um, you know, Floyd Abrams, who I was absolutely thrilled to have speak at our 15th anniversary. Um, I didn't. Uh, I didn't actually know about Jonathan until I started working at Fire. But he's definitely become one of my free speech heroes. Yeah. How did you meet Jonathan? 
it's, it's actually a funny story, and I've never told Jonathan all the details. Uh, um, uh, what he probably didn't know but might have been able to put together is that I met him because I'd heard a lot about him being you know, this great defender of freedom of speech. But I'd never actually, I hadn't actually read his book, Kindly Inquisitors, yet. And I have to explain, I'm kind of glad I hadn't read it before meeting Jonathan. Um, and I'll explain w- why in a minute. So I show up for, for this meeting with this uh, very, you know, unassuming uh, f- uh, f- fellow. We went and got um, uh, sushi together. And partially because since I hadn't read it, I didn't know to be as, uh, as intimidated by him as, as I would have been if I actually had read it. Mm-hmm. So, we're, you know, we, we probably didn't talk about free speech the whole time. We, we talked about, you know, comic book characters and lasers. And, <laughs> you know, I, I went into a lot of depth about, you know, what the best superhero to be would be. And I definitely am I'm a Martian Manhunter man myself. Although if I could have any powers uh, from the Marvel Universe, I'd immediately re- request um, Molecule Man. And this was a great discussion. We really hit it off. And uh, he's become, you know, one of my favorite people on the whole planet. And I therefore read uh, uh, Kindly Inquisitors afterwards. And I remember reading it and being like, uh-oh, this guy's a genius. I, I was just like, I, I wonder what, what, what I must have seen. And he, and he wrote that book when he was 28 or 29, he told me. Yeah, I know. It's, it, it's absolutely amazing. Um, but I, I've, never, I've never told him that part of the story that I hadn't actually read it before I met him. But after reading it, I was like, wow. And it's, it's just so amazing because he's such a – uh, humble, uh, decent, and, and, and uh, you know, morally courageous person. So that's a good segue into Kindly Inquisitors. Uh, you've called his book Kindly Inquisitors one of the best modern defenses of free speech. Mm. Why do you think this little book, and it's a little book, it's yeah. something like 150 pages, what, why do you think it's so important? Well, you know, it's it's a philosophical defense of freedom of speech. It's not a legalistic defense of freedom of speech. And I may be a First Amendment lawyer, but I get uh, I get uh, frustrated with my own people to a degree because I think they tend to – there's a tendency to explain uh, free speech is important because the First Amendment protects it. It's a circular yeah, argument. Well, as, as, as a law professor, I would say there, there, there's a certain roundness to that <laughs> argument. Um, and I think it's really important to get down to the, the philosophy of it. And when it comes down to it, there's not that much – accessible work on the importance of freedom of speech. Certainly, Karl Popper talked about, um, you know, ideas of the open society and that kind of stuff, but uh, it, it, it's not the most accessible work in the world. And so when I talk about uh, books about freedom of speech, it, I, I, I always talk about how it's um, it's a shame that we have to refer back to this wonderful book written in 1859 all the time, which mm-hmm. is John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. The same year that Darwin's On the Origin of Species came out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's it, how old it is. And it's, it, it's a fabulous book. Don't get me wrong. But, but there, there really haven't been that many uh, you know, eat, uh, accessible books about freedom of speech uh, since. But I always make this exception. With the exception of 1993's Kindly Inquisitors, uh, there, you know, there hasn't been a classic since 1859. Yeah. And in 2012, you published a book of your own, Unlearning Liberty Camp is censorship and the end of American debate, which Jonathan actually recommends in, in our interview. I'm curious, was Jonathan's work an inspiration for the ideas you talk about in your book? And how do your two arguments tie together? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm working on a next book right now, and I pretty much every chance I get, I mention something about uh, Rausch's work. And I think giving uh, the sort of intellectual system uh, by which there's uh, – that's open-ended and you can't call uh, uh, claim special authority, this Enlightenment era uh, uh, system, giving it a name, uh, which he named liberal science, uh, is so important because it would – you know, as Jonathan points out, it's a system that's been so successful we didn't even bother to name it um, because it was everywhere. And it, it really helped me understand that um, I'm – you know, I get excited about scientific history. But a lot of people sometimes will uh, talk about freedom of speech with uh, by comparing it to scientific method. Uh, re- and really what John- Jonathan helped me understand is that uh, that uh, scientific method is just a smaller part of this massive system of liberal science where you start, you know, skeptically inquiring about your world that no argument is ever really over. Um, so, yeah, he's had a tremendous effect on, on, on my thinking about that. And at the end of the, your book, you have a list of suggestions for students on uh-huh. how to improve uh, not only their lives but also their ideas. What are some, what are some of those, those things? Well, you know, w- one of them is uh, to always remember – um, that the things that make us most uncomfortable to talk about are oftentimes the most important things for us to be talking about, and that applies to relationships and societies just the same. But the one that I really want to emphasize is that I don't think you should you, know, you should think of yourself as educated unless you th- see it as an intellectual duty to seek out intelligent people with whom you disagree. 
And I think if we followed that simple lesson, uh, we would live in a much more uh, intellectually productive and much more bearable society than we currently do. Mm -hmm. During my conversation with Jonathan, we talk about the role that free speech plays in defending minority rights. Uh, it's something that Jonathan, Jonathan uh, a minority himself, likes to talk a lot about, as you know. Uh, and this got me thinking about a case Fire's been involved in recently at Williams College in Massachusetts, small liberal arts school. Um, and I, I believe this case sort of illustrates many of the trends that we've seen on campus today. You've got an overbearing, overprotective administration that likes to protect its students from wrongheaded ideas, student demands for censor censorship. But there was also a student at the center of this story that perhaps best illustrates the free speech principles and practices that you and Jonathan advocate in your books uh, and that you're going to advocate in your new book, uh, so far as I'm aware of it, uh, especially this idea of free speech as a way of life. You've been telling this story in a lot of your recent speeches. Can you rehash for us uh, the story and tell us a little bit about this unique student, Zach Wood? Well, for years now, there's a, been a program at Williams College uh, that I was actually a speaker at, believe it or not. Oh, when was that? Yeah, that was a couple years ago. Um, I, was, I was part of this uncomfortable learning um, program where they try to bring controversial speakers to campus to talk <laughs> like about Greg things. Like Greg Lukianoff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, that, my only thing is, like, I'm really not as controversial as you guys think, or maybe I am more controversial. Who knows? But, uh, but it was a great talk. It was a great turnout, um, great feedback. Um, and they've had a lot, of, a lot of people a lot more controversial than me over the years. And the new president of it is is an African-American student named Zach Wood. Uh, he's politically liberal, but he loves this idea of, of, of fostering, uh, you know, uh, meaty conversations. Um, and he wanted to invite the controversial uh, John Derbyshire. For people who don't know who Don, John Derbyshire is, he was a writer for the National Review. He, he wrote some uh, fairly successful books, but he also wrote some really racist articles um, uh, towards the end of his uh, towards his end of, end of his time at National Review, which led to him being fired from from National Review. Um, so he, he, John Derbyshire is really well known for some of, some of these racist articles. And uh, Zach Wood was like, wow, OK, I want to debate this dude. I want this guy to come on campus. I don't want to debate John Derbyshire. And I want to see what he has to say for himself. And that is the kind of uh, discussion um, this, and bravery, frankly, intellectual bravery that universities should really uh, foster. But in this case, um, the university president, who himself a, a, an older white man, um, decided to prevent his own student um, from having this debate that he really wanted to have. And I mean, talk about misguided paternalism. This could have actually been a great uh, and invigorating de debate. Um, it should, and it, you know, the student should have been complimented for and uh, having uh, for, for for inviting him. Uh, but instead, they decided it was better off that that debate never take place. Yeah, it's strange. In, in our interview with Jonathan that's coming up here shortly, uh, Jonathan talks about how as a gay man, the only way they were able to secure rights for themselves uh, was by holding the other side's argument up in plain view um, and then slowly demonstrating to your opponents th that there's something wrong with the picture that they've created for themselves of the world. Um, and we also talk within that interview about a case of a black man befriending a member of the KKK and through force of demonstration, force of example, and, and dialogue, showing him that his worldview was wrong, eventually leading to that man turning in his robe uh, and leaving the KKK. And actually, there is no longer a KKK in Maryland as a result of this guy, Daryl Davis's work in that state. So let's jump into our interview with Jonathan Rausch. Greg, thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. Jonathan Rausch, thank you for coming on the show today. It's great to be here, Nico. It's it's really come full circle for me because when I was an intern at FIRE back in 2010, they actually assigned Kindly Inquisitors for all of us to read. And then that summer, you had given a speech at our student network conference. Uh, and it, I recall it being like one of the best speeches. I've been to five student network conferences for FIRE at this point. I remember it being one of the better keynote addresses. Uh, Greg always One of the better. I thought we were friends. <laughs> <laughs> the best. I hope none of the other keynote addressees uh, hears this podcast. But Greg always talks about this book, and it came out in 1993, and it feels like it's just as timely today as it Alas, was. Alas, yeah, it's fresh as a daisy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but Greg talks about it being one of the best modern defenses of free speech that we have today. And uh, you know, it's been praised by Penn Jillette. Uh, George Will called it slender and sharp as a stiletto. Why is Kindly Inquisitors? Well, let's start off. What is Kindly Inquisitors? Who is a Kindly Inquisitor? 
A kindly inquisitor is a well-intentioned person who wants to shut down speech or debate or criticism because it's offensive and hurts somebody's feelings. It's what I call in the book the humanitarian challenge to freedom of speech and freedom of, of thought, which is, you know, if I call you a name right now, pick your pick whatever name you were called in school that you hate. Jerk. Jerk. Oh, we can do better than that. <laughs> um, it's going to hurt you at some level, right? Maybe. Maybe you're very thick-skinned, but maybe you're not. So the argument began to take shape in the late 80s and early 90s that words that wound were a form of so-called verbal violence, that they were verbal behavior, um, that they created a hostile environment so we had a right not to be exposed to them. And this gradually took shape and has become, I think, the biggest challenge out there in America right now, maybe the world, to freedom of speech and freedom of thought. So Kindly Inquisitors brings together the fact that the motives, as almost always is the case, are to try to be kind and try to be good and generous and do something good for society, but the result of that is an inquisition, which is where you investigate and punish people for thinking um, what they think and saying what they say. It's funny because I was actually reading this book, rereading this book for probably the fourth time at this point over the weekend. And right in the first chapter, you talk about how a very dangerous principle is now being established as a social right. Thou shall not hurt others with words. This principle is a menace and not just to civil liberties. At bottom, it thre threatens liberal inquiry. That is science itself. So where is the science angle come in here? This book is unusual. It's not a First Amendment book. and It's not about law or the Constitution. It's about what it is that science broadly defined does that's really special. By science, I don't just mean people in labs. I mean journalists, historians, psychologists, people at FIRE who are blogging, all the people who are involved in the development and creation of knowledge because they're all doing a version of the same thing. They're putting hypotheses out there, ideas. And they're subjecting them to this vast international web of public criticism, people trying to shoot each other's ideas down. We kill each, each other's ideas rather than each other, great human innovation. So you get social peace as a result of that, but you also get knowledge because at the end of the day, the ideas that survive are our knowledge on that day. That whole process depends on two things. First, people need to be able to publicly state their hypotheses. And these are the rules that you lay out in the book. Yeah, I lay out these rules in the book. It's, I call it the science game because it's a process. It's like an open-ended process with rules. Um, but the rules are everyone gets to put their ideas, their hypotheses into the mix, even if it's something objectionable. You know, the Holocaust never happened. Homosexuality is a curable disease. I'm gay and Jewish, so, you know, I know this is not fun stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing that needs to happen is all of that stuff needs to get subjected to criticism. Um, and that's painful, too, if, you know, if someone is putting the Declaration of Independence out there and someone else is saying, you know, trying to refute it with racism. That's unpleasant, too, but that's how we get knowledge. We're vastly poorer if we shut that system down, and that's what people are trying to do. Now, you, you talk in the book uh, a little bit about the inspiration behind it. Uh, and it goes back to Salman Rushdie and the, the Ayatollah Khomeini putting a bounty on his head. Why did you think you needed to write a response to that incident? Apart from the fact that I was 29 years old and actually 28 years old and thought the world was waiting to hear from me. Um, <laughs> Well, you talk, yeah, I, I actually remember uh, a speech that you gave at the Museum of Sex back in 2013, <laughs> and you said... You My said, most popular speech. It's, it's a great speech, and I, I urge all of our listeners to go to uh, YouTube and type in Jonathan Rausch. It's one of the first videos that comes up. It's a 2013 speech uh, that he gave at the Museum of Sex. But in it, you talk about if you're under 30 and you have a great idea, just go for it. And uh, was that what you did here? Yeah, I, I thought... I guess you remember the details, right, Nico? The, the vague story. I guess a lot of people are too young to, to remember this. Mm -hmm. um, so Salman Rushdie was a novelist, and he wrote a book called The Satanic Verses. And a lot of people who never read the book decided that by Satanic Verses he meant the Koran. So there were international protests against the book, and it was burned and people were killed. And then the Ayatollah Khomeini, who was in charge of Iran at that point, put out a death sentence on Salman Rushdie, uh, forcing him to live underground in total hiding because Khomeini said basically any Muslim in the world that wants to should kill this guy. 
Um, so that was bad, but what, what was even worse was this kind of very muddled response that came back from, from the West. Instead of saying, you know, this guy, maybe the novel was offensive, maybe it wasn't, but he had every right to publish it, and we're going to defend that right. A lot of people said, well, you know, threatening someone with death goes too far, but it was an offensive book, and you shouldn't be out there offending people, and what do you expect, and we don't certainly don't condone, and, and so forth, on and on and on. And I realized... I thought people had lost sight of the fundamental premise of intellectual freedom, the advancement of inquiry, which is no. If you can't offend people, you can't say the things that people need to hear in order to rebut and refute them. And also to create knowledge. And to create knowledge, which is what happens. Yeah, Yeah, which is the, the only way to get knowledge. Knowledge is like finding a needle in a haystack because it's so hard to get. And the only way you get it is to to harness everyone to the task of looking through the haystacks. Mm -hmm by putting everything out there and then putting everyone to work criticizing and sorting. So that happened in 1989, and then right around then, um, the first wave of campus political correctness hit, which in some sense was very separate from Rushdie, but made a different version of the same argument, which is if you say things that are deeply offensive, they may not be blasphemy, but they may be racist, and that will damage our community, and that will make people feel unsafe, and it's deeply offensive and wrongheaded. So colleges began issuing speech codes. This was long before there was a fire, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, that was pretty scary. So those two things together made me think, you know, it's, it's time to defend not just the First Amendment, but the reason we have a First Amendment, which is the production of knowledge and the creation of social peace, the ability to conflict over ideas peacefully, nonviolently. Mm-hmm. And the Rushdie affair points to one of the two challenges to liberal science that you identify in your book. That is the humanitarian challenge, if I'm interpreting it right. Uh, you know, the argument with the Rushdie affair, of course, was that these words hurt, they're, blasph- they're blasphemy. But there's also a second um, challenge, and that's the egalitarian challenge. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, actually, it's a little bit different, right? I actually mentioned, mentioned three, and the third is the oldest. I call it the fundamentalist mm-hmm. challenge, and that's the idea that... Um, I know what the truth is. I don't need to take seriously anyone who thinks I might be wrong. And why would you allow untruth to be propagated in the world? That's as old as the hills. Plato went in for that. I actually have an interesting question about that. Are, are you familiar with Francis Fukuyama's End of History? Yeah. Because the, the argument there, of course, being that with the fall of the Soviet Union, capitalism has won out as the great you know, organizer or way to allocate private resources. Is that what some of these people are arguing when they're arguing that you know we've reached a point where we don't need to have this debate anymore? We've reached the end of knowledge? Well, you know, these people have always thought certainty is the same thing as reliability. I I don't know about the end of history or the end of knowledge, but, but people assume that where knowledge comes from is me making up my mind. So if I sit alone in a room and I say Nico Perino has brown hair, and I conclude that it must be true based on the fact that I've concluded it, But they're wrong about where knowledge comes from. Um, Say you have a guy with crazy white hair sitting in his room by himself scribbling equations. That guy might be Einstein, but he might also be a madman. There is no way to know which one of those things he is, even in principle, until you take those ideas and put them in front of other people for testing and replication. The only place we get knowledge is through social interaction, through this process of checking. And the greatest advance in the entirety of human civilization, bar none, is the creation of not just a national but a global network of checkers, people who can check anything almost right away. The Internet's part of that. So that's a great thing, but it's also counterintuitive because it says we could be wrong about anything. I could be mistaken about your hair color. Um, We need to ask these other guys in the room here, the sound guy and the guy in the headphones over here. what do you think? Is his hair brown, blonde? Do we have a well, vote I'm for brown? Blind, so I, I don't think I, I get a brown. vote here. So they're all <laughs> saying brown. So that gives us some, some confirmation that the hypothesis might actually be true. Of course, you know, it might turn out eventually to be false. But that's where knowledge comes from. And the fundamentalist challenge has always been, well, we don't need to do that because I already know the truth. It's in the Bible or it's, you know, it's, it's in some other place. Um, so that one's as old as the hills. And then there's one I call the egalitarian yeah. challenge. And that's a much newer idea that everyone should be treated equally. And whatever anyone thinks is knowledge 
is knowledge because, after all, you know, um, we all have different points of view. And you and you talk in the book about those who argue for equal time for creationism right. in school, and uh, you talk a little bit about faith healing what, as well. Right, and Christian Science and yeah. all these other groups that have come forward, Afrocentrists, and mm-hmm. say, well, so wait, who who gives biologists? at universities the right to say how humans evolve. We've got our own idea for that, and it demands equal time in the classroom. Uh, Well, they're wrong. The only way you validate knowledge is through this process of checking. And other ways, you know, you can say anything you want, but you can't teach it as knowledge. Mm -hmm. But then the big one, I think, is this humanitarian Mm -hmm. uh, one that's that's really, um, it's really at the heart of what we're seeing right now on campus with microaggressions, the tantrum behavior we're seeing in places like Yale, um, it's going on and on, this idea, if you hurt me with words, if you deeply offend me, then you have violated my rights. Mm-hmm. And so your book came out in 1993 and was reissued, and it's never gone out of print, which is amazing, and I think a testament to the arguments that you make in it. Uh, but you reissued the book in 2013 with a new afterword. A lot's changed since 2013, even in the world of free speech. Do you think you're, well, first, what's the argument you made in the afterword and then does the afterword need a new afterword, given everything that's happened in, in the past three years? <laughs> yes, the afterword needs a new afterword. Um, but this book really should be in a three-ring binder because you're going to have to update it for the end of time. I, I try to remind people, this doesn't directly answer your question, Nico, but it's important to say, and it's a reason people should write checks to fire after they've, of course, bought my book for $12 on Amazon. Yeah, re- Did everyone reiterate. get that? Everyone in the room here? <laughs> Write checks to fire by kindly inquisitors. Got Not it. necessarily in that order. <laughs> um, but here's the reason what fire does is so important. The greatest idea that humans ever had is also the most counterintuitive idea. It comes up very recently in human history in the 17th century with John Locke and then James Madison writes it into the Constitution. And that's that we should not only tolerate speech and thought that is wrongheaded, seditious, offensive, obnoxious, heretical, or blasphemous, but that we actually benefit from this as a society. No one had ever said that before. They always said, of course you shouldn't tolerate seditious speech, criticism of the king, criticism of religion. Well, it turns out that this is a fantastic mechanism for creating knowledge and that through toleration you get social peace, but it also turns out that every day people are born as humans who don't believe that because our instinct is to say if someone's wrong, we shouldn't put up with that. So every day we have to push the rock back uphill. We've just got to start defending the First Amendment all over again, every day for the rest of time, and we just got to be cheerful about that. That's the burden that falls to folks like Fire and me and you're a generation younger than I am, I guess, what, 26, 27, whatever, and and you're— your kids are going to be doing the same thing. So, yeah, this thing will need constant updating. There is, there is no breather. There is no stopping point in the defense of free inquiry. Um, and there's, you know, I put arguments out there in my book, and, and then people come up with new attacks on free speech. So it goes on and on. Um, the specific answer to your question is that I added an afterword to the book because a new kind of argument was that minorities need to be protected from hurtful and hateful speech. And as a member of two minorities, one of them savagely oppressed in America until recently, gay, that's the opposite of the truth. Gay people got where we are only because we had freedom of speech. Um, So I needed to say that. And there's, so over the weekend, one of my colleagues here at FIRE, Nate O'Connor, had recommended this podcast to me uh, called Love and Radio, and it's a specific episode called uh, The Silver Dollar. And it's about this man uh, who lives in Maryland, I believe, named Daryl Davis. He's a black musician. But I believe it was in the 80s or 90s he befriended an imperial wizard of the KKK and through dialogue actually convinced him to quit the Klan. And when he convinced him to quit the Klan, he actually gave Daryl his clan robe. And I want to play a clip. <laughs> wow. I want to play a clip from that podcast because it goes back to a lot of the things that you talk about, Jonathan, about, uh, you know, minorities can't win unless they can engage the opposition in dialogue and show to them by, through force of example why they are wrong. So I'm going to pull up that clip right now. He said, 
that he respected me. The Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. He said, we may not agree on everything, but at least he respects me to sit down and listen to me, and I respect him to sit down and listen to him. The most important thing that I learned was that while you are actively learning about someone else, you are passively teaching them about yourself. All right? So if you have an adversary, an opponent with an opposing point of view, give that person a platform. Allow them to air that point of view, regardless of how extreme it may be. And believe me, I've heard some things so extreme at these rallies, it'll cut you to the bone. Give them a platform. You challenge them, but you don't challenge them rudely or violently. You do it politely and intelligently. And when you do things that way, chances are they will reciprocate and give you a platform. So he and I would sit down and listen to one another. Over a period of time, that cement that he talked about that held his ideas together began to get cracks in it. And then it began to crumble. And then it fell apart. And then a few years ago, Roger Kelly quit the Ku Klux Klan. He no longer believes today what he said on that videotape. Okay? And when, when he quit the Klan, he gave me his robe and hood. This is the robe of the Imperial wow. Wizard. That story from Daryl Davis really made me think back to a lot of the things that you said, and specifically one thing that you said in a video that Fire came out with a while back called, uh, where you said, we can't earn their respect or admire, and they in this case meaning the opposition, uh, those who are opposed to rights for minorities. We can't earn their respect or admiration by hiding from them. We've got to be in situations where we can confront and encounter them, sometimes angrily, but more often with persuasion. So I was wondering if you could respond not only to that video, but elaborate on what you had said in that video. And if you can, tie in that story of Frank Kameny that you always well, tell. Well, that's, a, that's a, a great and wonderful and long story. Um, but the sentiments you just heard in the, the audio clip were exactly what my experience has been as someone who was born in 1960, gay in America, um, a deeply, thoroughly, completely repressive and oppressive society. Um, gay people had no votes. We had no money. Most of us were hidden from public view. Um, and we were hated. But the reason we were hated was not that most people get up every morning and say, who am I going to hate on today? We were hated because we were feared, because of misconceptions and lies that were told about us. If you think that someone's going to seduce your children or rape your children or commit sedition against the U.S. government or has a secret network of communists to overthrow the government or is conspiring to end the American family, well, you're going to hate that person. So what gay people had to do, little by little, was engage in dialogue with our haters, which is not always fun, but we would never have changed minds had we just said, you know what, you people are all wrong, give us our rights right now. Um, I tell people that hate speech laws, you know, suppressing speech that's wrongheaded and hateful, is like curing global warming by breaking the thermometers. Um, the root problem here is fear and ignorance and hatred, and you go for that by correcting people. So here's what happens. In um, 1950, late 1950s, the Supreme Court, in a landmark case that no one's ever heard of, it's called 1 v. Olison, yep. um, amazing case, overturns the U.S. government and several lower courts by allowing a openly gay magazine to publish, not pornographic, a magazine of essays and thought. Um, that gave gay people a voice in public debate. Until that happened, we were censored by the government. And the post office, I believe in that case, wouldn't mail some of these issues. Right, right. The way they got us was through the uh, indecency statutes mm -hmm. because advocating homosexuality was indecent. So the post office wouldn't mail it, which meant you couldn't distribute it because there was no internet in those days. So the Supreme Court, in a one-line sentence, says First Amendment protects gay people's ability to speak. At almost that exact same time, a couple weeks later, a man named Frank Kameny is fired from his government job as an astronomer for the U.S. Army Map Service, and he's fired because he's gay. No other reason but because he's gay. Um, 
Most people in those days, if they were fired for being gay, they slunk away into disrepute. Um, often they couldn't get another job um, or were drummed out of their industry. Both were true of Kameny. He never got another job. He never served as an astronomer again. But he was unusual because he did not back down. He believed that the Declaration of Independence was a personal promise that the founders had made to him, and he decided to cash that promissory note. So he began an opposition movement. He appealed his firing all the way up the highest levels of the U.S. government. He failed. He appealed it to the U.S. Supreme Court. They refused to hear his argument. He appealed to the U.S. Congress. Um, he was summarily rejected by congressmen writing letters saying things like, of all the letters I've ever received, yours is the most disgusting. Um, 1965, he and some other people led the first peaceful, openly gay protest with a protest march in front of Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Home of fire. Home of fire. Um, symbolism was very intentional. Yeah. And another one in front of the White House. You can see tapes of it on YouTube. It's these like gay men and lesbians and mm -hmm their Sunday best, walking peacefully, holding signs, saying things like, the government should meet with homosexual Americans. Crazy in its day. So he does stuff like that. He's the first openly gay person to run for Congress in 1970. Um, he challenges the psychiatric diagnosis of homosexuality as a disease. He does all this stuff for years, and no one ever listens until they do start listening. In the 70s, people begin to notice what he and other gay activists are saying, and they begin to understand there's, there's some sense in this. Because we're holding the other side's argument up to plain view. They're saying horrendous things about us. We're child seducers. We're all crazy. We're sick. And then they're looking at us and saying, well, no, there's something wrong with this picture. Mm -hmm. An argument unfolds, and amazingly, within a generation, we win the argument, and like folks your age think nothing of same-sex marriage. Yeah, and there were some interesting and extraordinary outcomes uh, at the end of Kameny's life. Uh, do you want to talk about some of those? Oh, yeah, the well, I do. I always, management, which was I always tear up when I do because it's such an amazing story, but it's, it's tears well, of joy. So just a quick comparison. The world I was born into, 1960, and on through the 70s, Gay people could not work for the government. They could not have security clearances. They could not serve in the military. They were shunned by almost every religious group. They were viewed as um, mentally ill by the psychiatric profession. Um, they were arrested in their own homes for making love to each other, given criminal records for that. If they called them, they, they were beaten on the streets, and if they called the police, the police would often join in the fun arrest the homosexual instead of the person who committed the crime. Um, I could go on and on about that world. That's the world Kameny fought. So Frank died in 2011 in his, um, I think, 86, age 86. He lived long enough not only to see same-sex marriage be legal in multiple states and to see sodomy laws overturn and to see gay people serving in the U.S. government in secure positions, and to see gay people in the military. Um, he lived long enough in 2009 to receive a formal apology from the U.S. government from the very agency that fired him, now called the Office of Personnel Management. Um, he received their Theodore Roosevelt Prize for public service, their highest prize. He received a formal apology, um, which he accepted. He said, I accept. <laughs> and best of all to me, the director of the agency that had fired him, that was now apologizing, was gay. Openly gay. I know the story. I've heard you speak. Yeah. Say it many it's an times, incredible it never, story. It never, it never tires on me. So that's what speech and argument and confronting bad ideas will do for a minority group in one generation. There is no hate crime law or no anti-discrimination statute um, that can come anywhere near what speech and debate can do for us. And Frank Kameny's story and also Daryl Davis's story 
uh, I think, are testaments to that. If people want to learn more about this extraordinary man, how, how do you spell Kameny? Kameny, K-A-M-E-N-Y. Someday his name will be known to students across America. Um, it's not just yet. I've got an account of this um, that's fairly succinct in the new afterward to kindly mm-hmm. inquisitors, which have we neglected to mention that is... People should buy, right? People could buy for yeah. only about $12 Amazon. on Amazon.com. If you type in smile before Amazon.com, you can also get send a portion of that purchase <laughs> to fire. So you're killing two birds with one stone. I want to pivot a little bit because you're a Yale grad, right? Yeah. And earlier in this conversation, you had mentioned the, the incident that happened at Yale back in November where a group of students confronted a faculty member on campus whose wife had sent an email saying, well, maybe the administration shouldn't have used such a heavy hand um, in determining what students wear on Halloween. I don't really want to talk so much about that incident, but I do want to talk about your time at Yale and whether any of these issues were on your radar then. Uh, what was the environment like for free speech? And I specifically want to ask because in 1975, they came out with their famous Woodward Report which free speech advocates like us at FIRE always reference because it has some of the most eloquent language in defense of free speech and academic freedom uh, within the university context. It says we should think the unthinkable, discuss the unmentionable, and challenge the unchallengeable. Was that the ethos while you were at Yale? Yeah, it was the ethos um, when I was at Yale. I was an op-ed page editor of the Yale Daily News. So, you know, I was in the midst of publishing stuff that sometimes people didn't like. I went and recruited the first hard right-wing conservative columnist that, that Yale had had, a guy by the name of David Frum. Maybe you've heard uh, of him. I have heard of him. Went on to become a very famous conservative columnist. Yeah, and, and something something of a heretic in uh-huh. conservative ranks. Um, and a lot of people disagreed very strongly with a lot of the stuff David said. I mean, he was pro-Reagan, for heaven's sake. I mean, try mm-hmm. that in a college campus. But the four years I was there, I do not remember a single incident of shouting down or of disinvitation, there was the whole campus was a free speech zone. And if someone had tried to restrict that, I think the students would have been first in line to say, oh, no, you don't. Remember, in those days, this is the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. So not only is the Woodward Report recent, but so is the Berkeley free speech movement. Yeah. The ethos was very different then. Students in those days were looking for freedom from in loco parentis, the doctrine that the university should be our mommy and daddy, look out for us, keep us safe. We, we didn't really want that. We thought that was condescending. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was pretty much a, the whole campus was a free speech zone. And it, I just don't think it would have occurred to anyone to go to the administration with a grievance if we heard another student say something we didn't like. Mm-hmm. So we're running out of time here, Jonathan. I, I wanted to ask you, and I, I want to ask this of every guest that comes on the show. Greg talks about how there's no great modern defense of free speech. Uh, he always points to your book, uh, which is now 23 years old, I believe. But, Though recently revised uh, and, available <laughs> and available on Amazon. On Amazon.com. Um, who is your favorite author? And we've discussed this before. You would point to someone who is recent and has written recently about these issues, and you think quite convincingly. Uh, favorite author on a free speech issue, of course. You must refer to Greg Lukianoff. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to plug Greg's book, which is, Greg has actually written two excellent books on free speech. I was actually and referring they, to and, Fleming Rhodes. And they deserve a plug, too. Um, Greg has really, in some ways, been at the, at the front edge of bringing civil liberties arguments to the campus. But, yeah, there's this extraordinary man out there. His name is Fleming Rhodes. Um, he was the editor at the Danish newspaper, which I can't pronounce. Jillens Posten. Which yeah. I am told is like the Wall Street or Journal Jillens in Posten, region. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who made the decision to publish cartoons about the Prophet Muhammad, mm-hmm. and which set off to shock and surprise riots and several hundreds of killings around the world. Um, very serious death threats against him, against the newspaper, against Kurt Vestergaard, who was the cartoonist who drew the cartoons. I had actually, uh, I met I met Fleming back in September of 2015, and he was actually flanked by two large 
bald right. Danish bodyguards. It was an incredible sight seeing. And, the, and he will be for the rest of his life. Yeah. And this continues to reverberate in the uh, famous Charlie Hebdo incident last year. Mm. Um, we saw another place that was demolished because of um, alleged portrayals of Prophet Muhammad and so on. So um, the amazing thing about Kurt, uh, not, I'm sorry, about Fleming Rose is having faced a superhuman amount of personal pressure on himself and his family, he has not backed down. Instead, he has written a wonderful book called The Tyranny of Silence, saying that, that the harm that is done is not just through the law when people legislate against freedom of speech. It's through the whole culture when people chill what they say because they're worried about threats of violence. And when that happens, of course, the terrorists win. Um, and he has personally led his life um, standing up for this principle and being an example of the refusal to be cowed in much the same way that Frank Kameny did mm -hmm. two generations earlier. If you ever meet Fleming, he's the most modest, unassuming, ordinary guy. He's the last person who would say he's a hero. Yeah, Fire has a video coming out that features him. Uh, I recorded an interview when I met him, uh, and he's just very mild-mannered. He is, and he'd say I'm no hero, but the fact is he is a hero, and he's an example of the fact that ordinary people who are sometimes called upon to stand up in life will sometimes do that with amazing effects. So, yeah, he's written a brilliant book called The Tyranny of Silence, and I cannot recommend it too strongly. You can add it to the Amazon cart yeah, with kindly and <laughs> Better yet, if you write Nico Perino a letter or an email, he will send you all of these books for free. Oh, am I on the hook for that now? Maybe Fire will, Fire will let me expense it. But Jonathan, I really appreciate you coming on the show today. You're a busy guy. Um, but your stories, the stories that you tell, um, I think really resonate with, with those who who support free speech, and uh, we, we are indebted to you for your efforts. And well, we're indebted to you. Keep up the good work. The hope is with your generation, and it's so important that, that people in their 20s and people in their teens take up this torch. So thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. That was Jonathan Rausch. Jonathan is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and the author of Kindly Inquisitors, The New Attacks on Free Thought, which, as Jonathan pointed out, is available on Amazon.com. You can learn more about Jonathan and his work by visiting JonathanRausch.com or by simply Googling his name. But before we sign off here, I want to let everyone know about another exciting project sponsored by FIRE, and that's the feature-length documentary, Can We Take a Joke? Can We Take a Joke is a hilarious look at free speech, censorship, and outrage culture through the lens of stand-up comedy. And the documentary features some pretty damn notable comedians, such as Penn Jillette, Adam Carolla, Gilbert Gottfried, Lisa Lampanelli, Jim Norton, and more. And it actually also features our very own Greg Lukianoff, who is an executive producer for the film. Uh, the film was just acquired in early April by Samuel Goldwyn and is set to make its wide release in theaters and elsewhere the first week of August, so stay tuned for that. You can also learn more about the film by visiting its website, canwetakeajoke.com, or simply Googling its name. You can also find them on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, I want to thank you all for joining us on this very, very special first episode of So To Speak. Stay tuned for our next episode two weeks from now, and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and of course subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever else you stay up to date on your podcasts. You can find links to all those pages in the description to this podcast episode. This episode of So To Speak was produced by me, your host, Nico Perino, and edited and recorded by Aaron Reese and Chris Malpe. You can learn more about our sponsor, the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, at thefire.org. See you next time. <laughs>